Kia ora everybody, welcome to this episode of the Stag Roar, hope you're all doing well. We're up to episode 40 and we're talking to Ivor Cummins. Ivan's an engineer, another one, who's through his own health concerns delved into the literature and he's gone deep, over a thousand um, studies that he's looked at and he's also written a book with Dr. Jeffrey Gerber called Eat Rich, Live Long, where they pretty much come up with a theory to be healthy. And of course, it's based on a low carbohydrate diet. And he uncovers how insulin really is the lever that can have us in good health, bad health. And he comes up with a list of 10 things that can help you to improve your health status. So it's really, really good stuff. And is he's well worth following on Twitter. Love seeing his tweets. Love seeing the discussions that he's involved in. Um, he's really open-minded he's a bit cheeky on twitter as well it's quite good um and yeah him and dave feldman obviously get involved with lots of things when it comes to what is happening with ldl and trying to flip that paradigm so without further ado i'll bring you the episode because we go deep if it's a little bit deep for you i apologize but i loved it um if you want more information i'd highly recommend going to Ivor's website the fat emperor or his YouTube, as he says, and you'll get a bit of an extra explanation on what we talk about in this episode. Right, let's get into it. Enjoy. Kia ora, everybody. We're sitting down with Ivor Cummins, who's coming in for, from Dublin, Ireland, a place I nearly moved to. Um, Ivor, what did you get up to in the weekend, mate? Spain, was it? Oh, yeah, right. I was in Spain for nearly two weeks with my family, my five children, and uh, we had a great time. It was really, really hot every day, just like we like it. Lovely. And was the rest of Ireland there with you or just just you guys? Oh, yeah, just myself, my wife and the five children, yeah. That was it. It was enough. It was was enough. enough. Great. And so for those who um, don't know who you are, who is Ivor Cummins or the Fat Emperor? Right. Well, I started around 2012 researching into chronic disease because I got some poor blood tests and the doctors weren't able to explain them to me. So I had to research myself. And it's been a long road since. I now have a published book out with Dr. Jeffrey Gerber in uh, Denver. Uh, It's Eat Rich, Live Long. And it's our cumulative five or six years of research and his clinical experience put into a basically a a plan to get your health back, to greatly reduce your risk of chronic disease, lose excess weight and all of that. So it's quite a comprehensive book. Uh, But my original role was an expert problem solver in engineering, in complex problem solving in high volume production. So I had nearly 30 years of that. So it made it very easy to take on researching another technical sphere, uh, which is the health one. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so with that, I'm hopeful my brother's got um, high blood pressure following having some um, heart issues when he was younger. And I'm, I'm hoping that his chemical processing engineering background leads him into uh, figuring out how to solve that problem. So <laughs> having had, Absolutely. having talked to Dave Feldman and now yourself, um, your engineers seem to have it sussed. He seemed to think that it's questioning your belief all the time. What do you think it is about engineers that manage to get to get past all the rubbish? Well, yeah, I guess it is called the problem-solving profession, and that's the center of it. Now, quite a proportion of engineers are not amazingly good problem solvers. You know, they're just reasonably technical. But within engineering, if you get the the people who really focus on problem-solving, all the tools, the statistics, the Kepner-Trago, comparative analysis, hypothesis testing, the best guys in engineering have done all that for decades. So when they switch to something new, they can apply all those tools and they have all the experience. At least that's the way I see it. Um, if you have a biochemical background like I do, even better. Um, but certainly Dave, Dave is IT actually, so he's even more removed than, than I would be in a sense with a software background and no biochem. But you can just see the wonderful work he's achieved just from the engineering mentality of it, systems analysis. He's, he's worked out a huge amount. It's perfect. Beautiful. And so you are a big proponent of, of the craft test and, and finding the true population that have type 2 diabetes or hyperinsulinemia. And <clears throat> researching for you, I came across 
a beautiful article done by Jason Fung and then Grant Schofield, who we've interviewed a couple of times on this podcast. What is it about uh, Dr. Joseph Kraft that really got you excited? Right. Well, I actually found out about him through uh, Professor Schofield because a blog post he did years back, I happened to come across and he was working with Catherine Crofts, you know, PhD researcher and, uh, and others. And it would just fill the, a gap. I had studied insulin resistance for a year or two. I was very firm in my beliefs of, about how important it was in heart disease. But when I saw his blog post about this doctor who'd done 15,000 post-glucose insulin assays and written a book, it just really resonated with me that he was saying that most heart disease is underpinned by hyperinsulinemia and essentially diabetes, diabetic uh, physiology. And it really resonated. So I got his book and then I realized by Googling that he could still be alive, even though he was close to his mid 90s. So I found his office address, I left voicemails, and the next morning I got a voicemail back from Dr. Kraft himself. And I was stunned. And quickly I organized to go to Chicago with Dr. Jeff Gerber, my co author, and we interviewed Joe, Dr. Joe Kraft, in the Trump Tower Hotel in Chicago. <laughs> and that's on YouTube. But his work is so important. But as he said himself, he was swimming upstream for decades. No one in the diabetes organizations wanted to see diabetes as a disease of insulin. They certainly didn't want to see diabetes as being much, much bigger than anyone thought, because quite frankly, it's embarrassing. Uh, I'll just throw out something I got last week, uh, uh, the latest statistics. So if you include pre-diabetes and diabetes, just using glucose metrics, not Dr. Kraft's post-glucose insulin, which would get more people. Pre-diabetes plus diabetes in over 45s US adults, over 45 years old, around 63% are essentially diabetic. Now, if you used insulin, you'd pick up another chunk. Myself and Dr. Gerber think maybe it's in the 70s. That's stunning. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's beyond belief that maybe up to three quarters of your adult population over 40s share a, 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 the same dysfunction, the same disease process. It's amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. When <clears throat> working as an optometrist, you see it every day and the awareness of it's horrible and then the amount that are on insulin or insulin secreting medications and you just go, oh, dear God. <laughs> um, so how did, how did that fit into your health story? You, you said you had a bad, bad blood test. Why, why was this insulin theory coming up for you? Yeah, well, I knew nothing about insulin. I got standard blood tests. I was high in gamma glutamyl transferase, GGT, a liver enzyme. I was high in serum ferritin, uh, kind of an iron loading in the blood. And I was high in cholesterol. Uh, but I noticed talking to the doc that my GGT and ferritin were crazy high. I mean, they were, they were off the scale high. So although the doctor kind of said, oh, you know, GGT is not ideal to have high, and they did more tests for hemochromatosis, which is an iron loading disease, common, more common in Ireland. Um, but the test came back blank, and I got generic advice, food pyramid advice. And uh, I realized then, wow, my figures are crazy statistically. I knew that from my technical history, even though I didn't understand these exact measures precisely. And I went to two more doctors and I, I similarly got very little advice on the fixes, the root causes for these types of issues, or really on the implications for mortality or morbidity. And I realized, wow, three good doctors can't answer these questions. So I began to research myself uh, straight to the databases, PubMed, ResearchGate, I got logons, and I began to just follow the problem-solving path through these metrics. And within a few weeks of intense obsession, <laughs> I actually largely had the problem, which was excessive carbohydrate in my case. And over a seven or eight-week period, I shut all carbohydrates out, nearly all except for above-ground leafy vegetables. And uh, I went on a high healthy fat diet 
and all the metrics resolved and then a lot more. As you can imagine, when you fix root causes, it's not just the one or two problems that were visible, all the metrics got better. And I lost, you know, around 15 kilos and I felt fantastic. So it was a great, it was a great period. And then my obsession continued because I realized if I can do that research, discover this and make that impact on my life, what about the millions, hundreds of millions out there who will never know? So I kind of got a little bit uh, philanthropic then and said, right, I'm going to get out there with this stuff. And then I did. Yeah. And what do they say something specific about your cholesterol or just high cholesterol? I had a patient today that at 80 years old, she's been put on a statin because of high cholesterol. And I said, what, what about it? You're, you're 80, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's all the evidence that once you go to 55 or 60 or above, that really it doesn't even correlate anymore. It may go the other way. Yeah. Medicating old people is problematic. Whatever about young people who may benefit from the meds. But uh, the cholesterol, they didn't make too much focus on the cholesterol, just raised the heart disease risk and talked about food pyramid type things, more healthy whole grains, right? And we know, we know about that now. And um, the ferritin and GGT were the ones that were very high. I mean, my GGT was around 120. So the reference range is around 15 to around 55. And the ferritin was 530. Uh, well, in one particular type of units, and that should not really be over 250, 300. So they were the really high ones. And they were aware GGT could be driven up by alcohol, excessive alcohol. And I think most doctors only know that about GGT, that it can be a marker for excessive alcohol, which wasn't the case in, in my instance. Uh, I purposely kept my wine drinking stable over the period of my self-experiment. And I dropped the GGT down from 120 to less than 30. So, but anyway, I'm probably rambling around a bit. The GGT and ferritin were the big ones. Ferritin is an inflammatory marker, an acute phase reactant. So it is, does reflect the iron loading, but it also goes up with infections or inflammatory conditions. In fact, it's a fantastic marker for metabolic syndrome. People don't realize that. Uh, there are papers saying it should be the sixth marker for metsin. Uh, it's better than the other ones, actually. <laughs> but that never happened. And so what was it? Was it fructose making your liver fatty, or what was what was going on there? Essentially, uh, I, they sent me actually for a liver ultrasound based on the GGT, which was a fair thing to do. The ultrasound came back clear. So I was manifesting in these inflammatory markers, but had not yet exhibited clinical fatty liver on an ultrasound. So in the early weeks, I got the hemochromatosis test, the uh, ultrasound of the liver, and they came back blank. And that was the point of where the docs were tailing off. It was kind of like, <laughs> and then I said, well, hold on a minute. So I, I Googled my first night uh, GGT and mortality and morbidity. And within a few hours, I was, I was really angry. GGT is used by actuaries. I mean, GGT is a really good marker for future death and early mortality and and they didn't even tell me that and then i followed the rabbit hole ggt ferritin cholesterol within a couple of weeks i had kind of gotten to the point of realizing cholesterol is a really weak marker ferritin and ggt are pretty damn good markers and why they go high and then i fixed the why and that was it and so why did they go high and what did what was it specifically about low carb that fixed it Right. So in my case, I had been trying to eat healthy. So I was eating lowish fat in as much as I could. Uh, I was eating plenty of whole grain breads, you know, and pasta. I was following the food pyramid. Uh, I also was quite fond of orange juice and I knew it was really good for you. So I realized after a few weeks, oh, right, bad news. So I cut all the orange juice. Um, but essentially, yes, all of these rapidly digestible carbs were generating in me hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, and all the full milieu of what goes with that. I mean, liver inflammation, uh, I had the middle obesity. Um, so I had all the signs, but no one has every sign. Mm. So hence the metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome is a syndrome. There's five signs, and you can have some but not others. 
and you can add many more like ferritin and GGT. But in my case, I exhibited the problem through certain markers and not through others. Um, but the solution remains the same, right? Is to remove all the rapidly digestible carbohydrates, drop your GIP hormone, enhance your GLP-1 and PYY, and start reversing the diabetic type hormonal signaling that's at the root of a lot of our issues. Great. And so did you do a uh, insul insulin test or a glucose tolerance test then? Or was it just not I, on the radar? It, they, I asked for it at the eight-week period uh, after I had done my experiment to go back and validate what happened, and they didn't actually do it. So I think there's a resistance to doing insulin. So I actually got back my GGT ferritin and all the other ones, but I didn't get an insulin. And interestingly, I was so comfortable I was correct uh, at this stage. Not, not arrogant, but comfortable because my research was expanding, expanding, and I, I had discovered a network around the world of, of similar researchers, and I was connected to them. And I was realizing I got to keep going on this, but I'm largely correct. There's no question. So I actually didn't get an insulin test until much later, around a year and a half later. And then it came in, at I think it was 4.6 or something, which is fine. But I got a whole battery of tests at that point with um, Dr. Steve Horvitz in New Jersey, a buddy of mine. I was over there in New York, and he got me every test. <laughs> he basically opened menus from all the different laboratories, and he said, Ivor, what do you want? So I, I just got a mega test suite. And uh, it, was, it was all good. I mean, the adiponectin, which is really important to be high, uh, that's a fat-released hormone. That was off the scale high. My leptin, which you want low, low-ish, was off the scale low. And the insulin was low, and all the other metrics were, were perfect. So I was quite happy with that suite of tests. Yeah, that it sounds, sounds good. And like you say, you'd already probably fixed the the course of your problem yeah um the same and well the only thing is it, it's very glib to say it's just carbohydrate uh, refined carbohydrate sugars uh i did start eating more healthy fats and nutrient dense foods simultaneously uh i also began to because i was getting interested in vitamin d and, and the healthful aspects of the sun i was beginning to get more sun exposure so in fairness, it was a multi-factor intervention in those first eight weeks, but the dominant factor was the complete elimination of refined carbs and sugars, a removal of, of rapidly digestible carbs, and a replacement with healthy fats and fatty uh, natural grass-fed meats and fish. So mm. I, I did all that together. Nice. And so you also talk about two other things with the, the sunshine, and that's stress and sleep. Uh, were you under any of those conditions or, or did you change any of those conditions, do you think? Um, the stress, yeah, we I kind of say the three S's, stress, sleep and sun. Uh, the sun slightly more, but nothing really, really significant, I'd say. The stress, no, actually, unless I was very enthused and, and excited and motivated by what I was discovering and it made me less stressed. But no, my job continued. I was on business trips to Singapore during that period with big quality escalations. So stress, no. And sleep, no, no real change in sleep. Because at that stage, stress and sleep, I had not even really gotten into at all yet in that early stage. Uh, now, you do sleep better when you're eating a high nutrient dense, healthy uh, dietary regime. You tend to sleep better. You're also, I believe, fasting and ketosis probably indirectly enhances sleep and quality of sleep but lot, short answer not really it was mainly the carbon the nutrient dense fats yeah and also that sun during the day might tweak your circadian rhythm a little bit better yeah yeah um you're in you're in ireland and i'm from new zealand and the vitamin d things coming up a lot in places like that what is it specifically about vitamin d you say about mood and stress what's 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 providing us a feel good and then from a health perspective why, why is vitamin d so important yeah well one thing i'm concerned about ryan is you know vitamin d is generated by the sun in your skin and you can also get it through food uh, and i gave a lecture on vitamin d back in 15 i think 
but I'm still concerned, you know, to what extent is it the benefits of the sun, uh, which creates many photo products in our skin and releases nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation and has many other anti-inflammatory effects. So you can think of exposure to the sun and through your pineal gland, you've got all of these hormones affected by circadian rhythm and sun uh, exposure in morning or evening. So the sun has all of these myriad effects, including creating vitamin D. What worries me a little is how many benefits can you achieve by just taking supplements of vitamin D? Now, I think that um, supplements of vitamin D, if you're insufficient or you're very low, I'm sure they they have very good benefits because vitamin D partakes in so many positive reactions in the body. Uh, But I'm a little concerned that jacking up your vitamin D through heavy supplements may not give the benefit that you would expect from the correlation and epidemiological studies. Hmm. And there's also evidence that disease states can result in your vitamin D status reducing greatly. So there may be reverse causation here as well that, yeah, low vitamin D correlates incredibly with cardiovascular disease and mortality and many other diseases. But in some cases, the people's disease state may be causing the marker to reduce. And I know of quite quite a few data pieces around that, but I haven't got back or had the time to go back and research it. So I think in short, the benefits of the sun are, are many and varied, including vitamin D. So it's ideal to get safe, healthy, non-burning sun if possible, rather than just the chemical, I think. And I saw you caught up in a debate uh, with a few Aussies about sun and sunburn. You, you spoke on there, the non-burning sun, and and the vegetable oils got bought into it that it's it's going to make things worse. And I heard Tucker Goodrich talking about how the moment he got rid of vegetable oils, he tanned beautifully and didn't burn anymore. What is it about these vegetable oils that maybe cause burn and maybe cause, you don't want to say it, but skin cancer perhaps? Yeah, I would wonder about that. Well, Dr. Uh, I think it's Kate Blanchett. No, that's a, that's an actress. <laughs> Kate Shanahan. Dr. Kate Shanahan has a book, Deep Nutrition. And if people Google her, she's done articles on this very topic about vegetable oils, deleterious effects on the robustness of your skin to burning. And essentially, put very simply, the theory is that incorporating excessive PUFAs or polyunsaturated vegetable oils into your cell membranes, and that's where they end up. I mean, they end up in your cells. You're incorporating them into your body. Uh, Make the uh, skin structure very uh, susceptible to the effects of UV uh, through um, kind of superoxide generation. So when the UV hits your skin, there's no question the UVB causes a certain amount of genetic damage. And the UVA causes um, kind of oxidation and radical oxygen species because, you know, the sun is energy and it has negative effects. Now, the suggestion is if you've incorporated a lot of polyunsaturates into your structure, they're far less stable than saturated fats or mono. And you basically get a cascade of inflammatory radical oxygen species when you get excessive exposure to the sun and that it's synergistic. So if you have a low PUFA, low vegetable oil diet, it would be theoretically make you much more robust to the effects of the sun. Now, there is not really published science on this. As you can imagine, no one had a driver or funding to go after vegetable oils, which the whole world was telling us were healthy, to look for negative effects, especially not linked to sun exposure. Right? So it never happens. We don't have published science. But the anecdotal evidence coming from all around the world on the difference when you cut out vegetable oils and you eat a healthy diet in your resistance to sunburn is really growing and personally n equals one i found a dramatic difference just like tucker goodrich and all the others it's quite stunning actually how robust you become to the sun and now i could go out with an irish tan i could go out for an hour or two in midday sun to get slightly pink, whereas before it would be 10 or 15 minutes. So it's anecdotal, but it's interesting how 
all of the experiences of people around the world are matching the theoretical science uh, best described by uh, by Dr. Kate Shanahan. Yeah, and I've I've got plenty of Irish heritage, more of the all of all of type, but yeah, I've definitely noticed a big big improvement in the time and the degree of burn. And I suppose one of the smaller, nearly research topics is that immaculate degeneration and how. Um, excessive vegetable oils might be one of the causes of, of macular degeneration and, and that, that reactive oxygen species at a high energy area like the macula causes that degradation and so it, it might be the one thing that's poking its head up that says I'm, I'm a research researchable thing and, and these vegetable oils aren't doing much good here what else is going on so yeah um, and there's interestingly, there's there's a lot of science out there people might not be aware of where they explored the vegetable oils in the 90s. And uh, it didn't really get very well publicized. It was against the dogma. But uh, to give one example, the vegetable oils were shown to be extremely important in enabling liver damage from alcohol, you know, in many animal experiments, to the point that one team said these vegetable oils are required to achieve liver damage from alcohol, where they sozzle the rats, right, with intravenous ethanol for their full life. And when they gave them just saturated fat and lard, uh, they essentially couldn't damage the liver. But when they gave them a few percent or right up to 40% of polyunsaturated oils in the diet, their liver increasingly just fell apart, necrosis and everything. So imagine a team that essentially goes on paper saying we think that these polyunsaturates are required for liver damage, not just that they make it worse. And we've got other studies as well on many other obesity, many animal studies showing that soy oil is more obesogenic than even coconut oil and fructose together in the diet. So there, a lot of them are animal models. But let's just say the vegetable oils have huge amounts of science against them and the science supporting them, I've gone through it. It's very weak, very weak indeed, hmm. but very popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it, having a small daughter, it brings up a topic for me in that the um, milk formulas are packed full of these soybean oils and you know, you're know you not getting the DHA and EPA in them. You know, is, is that something that you're coming across, that this is just a recipe for disaster? It's, yeah, right. It's quite frankly, it's shocking. Uh, vegetable oil and sugar, essentially the two cheapest, junkiest food components in the food industry world. And essentially that's what's going into formula. Um, a friend of mine, an engineer, smart guy, actually researched and eventually from Austria, he had to import uh, formula based on goat's milk, which was the least bad he could find. You know, it didn't have the vegetable oils, it didn't have the sugar really in it. Uh, but it's a huge problem because over the last 50 years, that's pre programmed all the children all over the world in a negative way, I would say. So it's just added to the vegetable oil in our diets, the sugar refined carb in our diets. There's, there's intergenerational multiplier effects going on, I think. So I think with the obesity and disease epidemics, even if you stopped eating bad stuff now, you wouldn't suddenly see them collapse because I think there's been, you know, from generation to generation, a predisposition has been baked into the last 50 years of expanding disease. And it's going to take a lot to reverse it. Wow. Uh, yeah, bad. Bad, all right. Now, so you mentioned your book there. Um, do you have some sort of, I don't know, repertoire of tests that you'd recommend somebody go to? Ah, yeah, well, we do. We try not to get too much. Our editor, professional editor, didn't want to get buried in the weeds of testing. Uh, but the top test for a middle-aged person uh, in terms of heart disease, but also all-cause mortality, is the calcification scan. So it's a five-minute CT scan. It's around $100, $150 in the States. And that will immediately tell you your degree of arterial disease. Not with perfect accuracy, but beyond all the other risk factors combined. That's been proven. So it sees the uh, calcification that's built up in the coronary arteries, 
And that reflects the decades of inflammatory disease that causes many other things, but especially heart attacks. So a high score could be 20 times the risk for a future heart attack than a very low score or a zero score. So it's a 20x risk multiplier, rough and tough. So that's, that's the diagnostic. When you get into blood tests then, say you do have a high score and you need to take action, and the way you monitor that in the short term is your bloods, uh, we do like the HOMA, H-O-M-A, the homeostatic model of insulin resistance. And that just uses fasting insulin and fasting glucose. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. If you're below 1.2 or 1 in the HOMA, H-O-M-A, um, you're very likely to be insulin sensitive, and it's a great marker. If you're above 1.5 or certainly above 1.8, you're insulin resistant and you've got issues. So that's a great marker from fasting glucose, fasting insulin. GGT and ferritin are great markers of inflammatory problems that pick up things sometimes others don't. And then you've got your glucose tolerance test and your insulin-like craft after a glucose tolerance test. And if you get the two-hour insulin after drinking 75 grams of glucose, that's probably one of the best tests there is in blood tests. If it's below 30, you're very likely non-diabetic physiology, euinsulinemia, which is great. And if you're above 40, you're pretty likely to be insulin resistant or diabetes in situ, you know, partially diabetic. But that requires drinking glucose and getting a draw two hours later. So it's a little messier. And um, other ones in America, particularly adiponectin and leptin, having adiponectin high and leptin low is a really good indicator of your adipose tissue functionality which is one of the roots of insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, is when your adipose tissue begins to become compromised, your cells. Um, so that they're great tests, but maybe only in America in specialized labs, I, I reckon. Yeah, so you, if we can dive deeper into adipose tissue, obviously it's a, a massive energy store for us if we need it, and you, and you talked about fasting. What is it about the adipose tissue and getting the right type so that it's metabolically metabolically active? And why is insulin resistance going to give us this lardy type midriff fat? Yeah, well, the adipose tissue appears to be kind of one of the first steps in your body collapsing into hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. And briefly, if you eat the right foods and you don't overindulge, um, there's two ways your adipose tissue can expand, or your adipocytes, your fat cells. One is hyperplasia, where you can make more fat cells, but they all re remain a reasonable size. So you can eat more, you get more fat cells, they stay small, and that enables them to stay insulin sensitive and to stay healthy. So that's adding more cells, and that's the classic metabolically healthy obese person. You've got a guy up to 40 BMI. They have no problems with insulin resistance. They got great blood markers. How can that happen? Well, they're hyperplasic. They're able to keep expanding and making more fat cells, and the fat cells are staying healthy. Now, not forever, but that's one way. The other extreme is, it often happens with Asian people, but, but all nationalities, is someone who's a tofi or thin outside, fat inside skinny fat. And those people have gone into hypertrophy. So rather than making more fat cells and keeping the fat cells reasonably sized, their physiology, their genetics, or what they're eating, and many factors causes them to stretch their existing fat cells to take up uh, the extra energy. And once the fat cell begins to get hypertrophy and it gets larger than it ought to be, then you have a mechanical biochemical problem in the fat cell where the signaling of glucose and insulin begins to break down. And that is one of the cornerstones of your whole system becoming hyperinsulinemic. Once your fat cells become hypertrophic or too large, your adiponectin falls, your insulin rises, and you, the crosstalk between your adipose cells and your liver and other organs is enormous. So when your adipose cells swell too much, the whole system begins to collapse. And that's been demonstrated in animal studies and, and much other science. 
So you got to protect your adipocytes. And the best way is to eat a healthy diet, not overconsume. And some of the best tests for it are adiponectin and leptin uh, and insulin, of course, and post glucose insulin. Mm. And so, with this big, big amount of adipose tissue, you're going to get lots of leptin. And if your brain's ignoring it, you've got leptin resistance. And then, like you said, you can end up with your, insulin and glucose problems as well. Is that right? It's a cascade, yeah, and it's centered around your adipose tissue. Interestingly, people with lipodystrophy who can't make adipose tissue, they nearly all are diabetic while being skinny. Yeah. So there's so many proof points of this. And uh, yeah, there is another problem. People who are very overweight but remain insulin sensitive can find it very difficult to lose weight, even with low carb. And one of the problems, knock-on problems, is that when you become healthy and your leptin drops and you become hypoleptinemia, I'd be low leptin. Often the very low leptin signals for hunger. Mm. So some people who are ex-obese, who get their leptin down, they shrink their fat cells, but the fat cells don't really go away. They just shrink. They go to small fat cells. They get healthy. Their insulin signaling is working. Everything's great. Small fat cells. But now you've got a lowered leptin signal. And that can, ironically, give hunger stimulation to that person. So they're kind of, it can work lots of different ways. Low leptin can make you hungrier and make it harder to really fast and lose the excess weight. Yeah, lots of, lots of different cause-effect arrows here. And I said when we spoke with Megan Ramos with, from Intensive Dietary Management, she's a little lady, but she, like she said, she was skinny fat and type 2 diabetic polycystic ovary syndrome and it wasn't until she kicked her insulin back in line that things started to go well for her. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Lustig's figures, maybe 50 million US people now would be in that category of not being very overweight, but having metabolic disease like we're talking about. That's a lot of people to be skinny fat on top of all the masses of obese people. But at least the obese people know they're probably carrying health risk. So I work on behalf of David Bobbitt of Irish Heart Disease Awareness, and he's a guy who is skinny fat. Uh, he had massive calcification, he luckily discovered. He then found out weeks later they never diagnosed his diabetes. His blood sugar was going up to 4x normal after a meal. And he put a few million into trying to get this kind of message out. But, but interestingly, he is most concerned philanthropically for the people who are not greatly overweight. And the reason is that People who are very overweight already get an earful from their doctor. They know there's risk. At least they're aware and they could try and take action. But the people who are not really overweight might no smoking. They might exercise a lot. And they don't realize they're at huge risk of, of a heart attack. They get a false sense of security. And he finds that really, really frustrating. And I, I agree with him. Those people need to be woken up. Yeah, and the amount of people that... Drop, drop dead, dead on a on a bike or on the golf course, um, f from you know a heart attack is is a is a scary thought. If if you getting the CAC done and you do find that you got high levels of calcium, what what something that you can do? You spoke about um, vitamin K and and getting that calcium back into the bones. Yeah, the K two is an interesting one, and certainly it has a place. Some people seem to believe it's it's almost magic. <laughs> um, that, that, yeah, I'm a little worried because it is multifactorial heart disease. I mean, lead poisoning alone might give you arterial disease when the other factors are, are not there. There are many factors, uh, but there's a few main ones. So the K2 people uh, often say, well, a lack of K2 means the calcium ends up in your arteries where it should not be. And I just have a slightly different view based on the literature that the calcium is recruited into inflamed arteries as a dynamic and specific process through evolution. It, the process is bone formation, and it's triggered by the uh, inflammatory vectors in an artery that's, that's got atherosclerosis. So I believe it's an active process where your body brings in the calcium to help stabilize the plaque, the vulnerable plaque. 
and that's largely agreed. The idea that it just ends up there by accident, I, I don't subscribe to. However, I would say vitamin K2, as per Western Price, has huge benefits in the body. So getting K2 is very important. Maybe not, though, just simplistically to stop the calcium ending up in the wrong place. But if you take the list of things, we have 10 rules. And, um, I mean, removing refined carbohydrates and sugars for someone who has any diabetic physiology going to a lower carb diet because they've got damaged metabolism, they now can no longer eat the healthy carb that might have been possible once. Um, get nutrient dense healthy fats, and that'll include K2 and, ma and magnesium, potassium, all these important biochemical vectors in the body you need for health. You get those into your diet, right? So that's another thing. Fasting is another thing that has huge benefits, which is enabled by a healthy low-carb diet because you can obviously fat burn more fluently. So fasting regularly is, is the science is exploding on that as to the benefits. Um, and then you've got sun, stress, sleep are all vectors towards cardiovascular disease if they're in the wrong place. So if you have a high score, get all those right and so on. So in the book, we go through all the things that will work against uh, atherosclerosis proliferation. And if you have a high score, you need to do all those things. And perhaps medications may be appropriate with a high score, uh, certainly in the short term, to stabilize plaque. You know, we're not anti-meds. But like you say, we shouldn't be giving meds to people who are elderly who don't, don't really need them. Um, so many different things. I think the key message of calcification, though, and I am going on a bit, sorry, is that it's a progressive disease of atherosclerosis. Naturally, when people develop calcification, it will rise every year by maybe 20, 30% as they keep doing the wrong thing. It rapidly increases. That's almost a mathematical fact. However, what's emerging is if you have a high score today, if you take all the right actions, you can stop it progressing and even regress it. So there are stories and there's published papers showing regression, stabilization, and slow increase. And all of those states, if you achieve them, plummets your future risk. So you might have a high score of 1,000. You've got enormous 20x risk of a heart event. But if you can keep that 1,000 each year going to 1,040, 1,080, you've reduced the disease process so much that your risk actually begins to fall back to someone with a low score. So that's the huge message of hope that is not recognized by the authorities. The authorities believe calcification is inevitably inevitable and progressive and follows mathematical general guides. And it's not actually true. So I think this is the hope in the coming decade that people will realize they can find out their score and they can take action to stop it progressing. And I think that's going to be huge. Beautiful, because that's what I wanted to get out of um, our chat is that you can identify things, but what do you then do? And if you go with conventional um, thinking, that means going on a statin. And, and I know you were tagged in a discussion about Ron Krauss and, and Peter Ortiz's chat the other day, um, <laughs> which, which we'll leave on Twitter. But um, you're, you're lucky in your part of the world you've got Asim Mahultra speaking about you know the overall picture of, of the statin is maybe we might get you one day if you're lucky, but the other side effects of, of breaking down or blocking cholesterol synthesis might mean it's not worth it. What do you, what do you say your thoughts on that? Yeah, the statin, I, I tend to keep out of the meds stuff. Um, I've said on Twitter when arguing with people, it seems you're not allowed to have an argument about statins without being called a statin denier. Yeah. And yet I've repeatedly had to send out a tweet maybe 20 times that myself and Dr. Gerber agree that statins bring benefit for um, prior heart attack, right, secondary prevention, um, for very high CAC score is essentially like you've had a heart attack. It's nearly a risk equivalent. And for very, very good markers of metabolic dysfunction and diabetes where you clearly have major issues, almost like you have a high CAC score if you don't get a scan, that statins there can ameliorate and stabilize plaque and cause some benefits. Now, the big question is what you said, Ryan. The negative aspects of statins are being 
highly contested and fought over. And it's very hard to quantify them exactly. So I see the whole area as quite gray. And I think, unfortunately, it has to be down to personal choice for people. You know, they, they, can, they can see the, the potential benefits, you know, <clears throat> percentage reduction in events. Um, now, they may not delay the event for very long. So you may have been going to have a heart attack in 2023, but with the statin, it may be in 2024. I mean, you know, uh, the mortality benefits are moderate at best. And again, how long do they postpone the mortality is being debated. So you've got these kind of benefits, um, but the negative side is, is very hard to determine. Um, it, it's a really tough one, you know, it's a tough one. And that's where I think the Ron Krauss idea chat was quite good. They went into that markers of, of metabolic disease and, and they really discussed it in depth. And that was one of the really good things I got out of that conversation. Yeah, and I think it, the, probably the remaining argument uh, is, is, is the LDL particle count a, a dominant independent driver of atherosclerosis? as in the particles go into your artery wall through the endothelium and they are causing a lot of our issue? Or are the particles just a really great proxy for metabolic dysfunction? So we know that ApoB goes up. The best thing to put up ApoB is insulin resistance syndrome. So I think the remaining discussion around ApoB and small dense LDL is how much is it driving causally independently and how much is it reflecting other metabolic dysfunction that we know is huge in the world? And that, that discussion will go on. Um, I think there's some interesting proof points which I like bringing up and are not popular with certain people. For instance, the Catavans, who are the poster child for no heart disease, they've, they've been studied in the 90s because their heart disease is so low. Everyone wants to know what's going on. Um, their ApoB particle count is high and their HDL is low. And if you look at their actual bloods against risk for heart disease, they should be through the roof. They should have really high heart disease. But they actually have the opposite. And it just shows we've got to be careful with these markers, you know. Um, of course, what's distinct about the Catavans is they have the lowest insulin practically in the world. Their blood glucose is in their boots. They've got a great omega-3, omega-6 ratio, right? And they have no hypertension. Their hypertension doesn't increase with age. Their insulin doesn't increase with age. So all what's different about the catavans are basically the things we talk about in our book as being important. And it would appear if you get all the really important things right, then you break all the rules about the other markers, the cholesterol markers. It's not too surprising. And it, and it goes into that inflammatory insult to start that process of atherosclerosis up, right? Is that correct? The endothelial distress, yeah, the low nitric oxide. I mean, atherosclerosis occurs at certain points, you know, in the artery. It doesn't occur throughout. You know, there's clearly a geometric precision as to where it occurs. Some people have one or two massive plaques and they can get a heart attack and the rest of their vasculature is clean. So, yeah... It, it's hugely relating to arterial health. And then you've got all these other factors that play into it. Um, so, yeah, and even, even within that, you can have atherosclerosis but never have an event. So you can actually have quite stable atherosclerosis, you know, or you, you could have a relatively small amount in a certain spot and you can get a burst. So it, it's got a localized nature. It's not in veins. It's in arteries. The other thing is it only occurs in arteries where you have vasovasorum or little feed arteries into the wall of the artery. So there's another whole uh, hypothesis around atherosclerosis where the endothelium, the inner lumen, is not the place where atherosclerosis initiates. It initiates deep in the wall and it's actually fed by the little arteries that feed the artery wall of the big artery. So, I mean, there's so much controversy here, and, and it is not proven, any of these things. It is an open question in spite of 50 years of focused on cholesterol. Intriguing. <laughs> um, keeping it a bit uh, more positive, what, what do you sort of 
feel for your part of the world in terms of the low carb movement. We've seen lots of publication about David Unwin's work within the NHS reversing things, and as I said, Asim Mahultra getting things through Parliament. Um, how do you feel about life in the UK? Yeah, well, it, it's certainly coming on in leaps and bounds with leadership like that. And just yesterday, I posted on Tom Watson, uh, the deputy leader of, of the Labour Party, one of the UK's two huge parties, has come out on BBC Four and he's lost 95 pounds or 45 kilos in a year. And he is saying to people, guys, sugar and refined carbohydrates are the problem and we've got to change our guidelines. So that's on BBC Radio 4 yesterday. So, and we've got the PHC, the Public Health Collaboration UK with Sam Feltham and the Seam and, and Unwin and all the guys. Uh, so there's huge, I think there's, the next 10 years is going to see a major change in the landscape. Less so Ireland, uh, though we, I think we'll see movement too. Um, I think we're entering probably what Professor Feynman calls the second low-carb revolution. Atkins was the first, and it failed. And I think the second will succeed. We can look to the enormous popularity of Andreas Einfeldt and Diet Doctor in Sweden uh, and expanding rapidly. And the increasing number, I think the rats are going to have to leave the sinking ship, that the momentum is going to get big enough that researchers who try to cling to the old ideas will begin to look around and say, uh-oh. And once they start leaving, there'll be a tipping point. Uh, but I reckon industry and many other and professional pride of researchers is going to continue to work really hard against this becoming the new paradigm because there's so much at stake in food industry, pharma, you know, in, in professional academic credentials, if you're overturning 30 or 40 years of, of, of dogma, you know, it is a very interesting 10 years coming, I think. Yeah, and we've, we've already seen um, Tim Noakes manage to get out of it, fighting the dogma. Um, Absolutely, that's huge. Yeah. And then in Australia, I've been a little bit nervous myself moving here and, and talking low carb with Gary Fickey, but I hope with the Noakes result means that you, you know there's there's you don't have to hide that anymore. You know, it's it's been shown, and you, you've got Sarah Halberg's was it seventy papers saying you know this works. <laughs> uh, absolutely, and of course Noakes is a major finding. I mean, uh, with a, an appeal or repeal process as well. They have found that it is is valid in science and valid to promote low carb uh, officially, and, and that's huge. So yeah, I think we're it's going to be interesting. It's going uh, to be absolutely, mate. And so I'll let you get away because I know you've got to rush off for more low carb shenanigans in the USA. But where do people find you? Because um, uh, I love I love seeing your posts on Twitter, and I know you've got uh, some website with some good content on there as well. Where do people find you, mate? Well, I think uh, if you Google Ivor Cummins, uh, you'll <laughs> hit YouTube, you know, which is my YouTube. It has a lot of free interviews and talks from around the world with experts and my own talks, all free, um, at Fat Emperor at, in, on Twitter and thefatemperor.com, uh, my website. So they're probably the main places. But Googling my name gets a lot, a lot of hits now. And I just say to people as well, this, this enormously important calcification test, if you Google Widowmaker CAC, so two words, Widowmaker CAC, uh, you'll hit a viewing of the movie. And it's fascinating, big budget movie, very exciting and really important people get to see that. And eat rich, live long. Yeah. Obviously, that covers it all. Okay. And uh, how did you manage to get into Costco? That's awesome. <laughs> Victory Belt, our publishers, I, I think, uh, you know, they've got their significant and they distribute through Simon & Schuster. So they're, they're great guys. They got that contract with Costco, yeah. No, that's great. So before you go, what's something that you'd like to leave the audience with or a question or an ask of the audience that you'd have? Oh, I already kind of did it with the Widowmaker CA. <laughs> 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 uh, and ask of the audience. Well, I'd, I'd always say, you know, people people need to think of, of, of basic concepts. I mean, I often say when if you don't measure it, it don't get fixed. That's an engineering phrase. Be very careful if that you're not measuring the wrong things or, or listening and being told what to measure and what's important. 
as our cholesterol conversation. So make sure you're, you're measuring the right things. And then um, I always say as well, show me the data. Endless uh, media coverage of experiments with mice and other things. And it takes three minutes to get the original paper, look at it and find out it's highly flawed. Or they've said high fat diet causes Alzheimer's, causes obesity. And then you find out they've actually put 25% sugar in there with the fat. So I think as well, people just really need to to keep an open mind and 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 realize that dogmas that have occurred over the last 50 years in cholesterol and, and low fat, you know, they're not conspiracies. It's just humans en masse doing what they do. Um, when movements start and, and they're in everyone's interest to continue, it can take 20, 30 years to reverse those those ideas. And and that's what we're in now. So it's not conspiracy. I hate when people use the word conspiracy. There's an element of conspiracy that industry have funded and supported science that they would prefer. And over decades, that's a lot of science generated. And the media as well, with advertisers, are biased. But it's not really conspiracy. It's, it's happened throughout the whole of human history, this kind of thing. But yeah. we'll beat it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> All right, mate. Thank you so much. And, um have a great trip to the USA and I'm sure there'll be plenty to come out of that trip as well. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Good luck. Enjoy it. Bye now. How good is that man? And how good is the statement? Show me the data. Goes back to what we've talked about a lot. You need to question things. You need to go deeper for yourself. If you don't understand something, don't just take the norm. Don't just be told to what and dictated to what to do find out for yourself, have greater knowledge for yourself, and from there you can make a truly educated decision. Of course, our episode is brought to you by Waikito, W-A-I-K-E-T-O on Facebook. I share lots and lots of the research, especially from people like Dom D'Agostino, Professor Grant Schofield, Dr. Karen Zinn, uh, who else, Rhonda Patrick, Tim Nugs, whoever you want really, it's all there. And we share all the podcasts on Waikito as well. Unfortunately, I forgot to hit record on the Zoom conference. So the YouTube video for this will be another images uh, YouTube video. But you can always find the audio on podcasts. And we have the links there in Waikito Facebook page. There's also information around exogenous ketones. As I said, we link a lot of information from Dom D'Agostino, the inventor and founder of exogenous ketones who, as I spoke about in the podcast, Peter Atea did an awesome interview with Dom D'Agostino. Hopefully one day we can get him on the stag raw and, and he can lay out the research behind exogenous ketones. I had them on Saturday for rugby and I forgot just how much of a game changer things are. The micro recovery between efforts in a game of rugby is just phenomenal. Um, especially on Saturday where we scored a few tries and had to get ready to set up again for the next kickoff. Um, the clarity, the decision making, just awesome. I love them. If you want to get your hands on some and try it out, head over to waiket0.proveitnow.com and follow the link to get yourself in order. Cheers. I hope you have an awesome time. Loving the feedback after the last episode and I hope that wasn't too much uh, into the weeds this episode and you learned a little bit and um, it opened your mind somewhat. Cheers.